Hello students, this is a brief discussion of the healing of the paralytic in Luke chapter 5. And first I'm going to read the passage and then try and draw out some of the uh, important facets of it. Now, I'm not going to write everything down in the PowerPoint for you, uh, so you're going to have to listen carefully and take notes. So here it goes. One day, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and te teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him for healing. And some men brought on a stretcher man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him in his presence. But not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a stretcher through the tiles in the middle, into the middle in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, As for you, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and Pharisees began to ask themselves, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them in reply, What are you thinking in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. He stood up immediately before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then astonishment seized them all, and they glorified God, and struck with awe, they said, We have seen incredible things today. So basically some guys tear off another person's roof and lower their friend down in front of Jesus, hoping for a miracle. Now one vocab word to uh, get in our uh, notes here that is important is blasphemy. And this would be a sacrilegious or dis disrespectful word or deed directed towards God. And so this is a very serious uh, crime in the Jewish understanding of things, you know, because you're directing this against the Lord of heaven himself. Okay, now on to the meteor portions of uh, this passage. Uh, I think one of the first or most important things to talk about is, is the characteristics of good friendship that can be seen in this passage. And the first thing is that uh, good friendship is built on sacrifice. Good friendship is built on sacrifice. And that's crucially important. And if you go back to this uh, scene here, the guys lowering down their, their sick friend, you know, you don't see them. But to think of what this might, this must have taken, you know, this is not carrying someone in your house, you know, next door. I mean, the towns and villages would have been spread out over the Judean countryside. There are no paved roads to walk on. Uh, so they had to take their friend almost certainly a couple of miles carrying him and and bringing him to Jesus. And, you know, that, that takes a lot of love in order to be able to do that. And the second real lesson here is that good, good Christian friendship is directed towards Christ. You know, what these guys are doing is they're helping their, their buddy out by bringing him towards Jesus. And so that's, I think, one of the key signs of a good friendship is that you know, if, if someone is bringing you closer to God, if someone is making you a better person and, and bringing out the very best in you, well, that's, that's the sign that you found a real treasure there and you better hang on to it because not everybody has that effect. So these, uh, these good friends are, are, are bringing, you know, their paralyzed friend towards the, the Lord of heaven and earth, or towards the one that can really heal him and can restore him fully to life. And, it, and Jesus does so, I think, even more than they initially imagined. I think they were probably thinking, we'll just get physical healing. But Jesus provides something else as well. And the third thing to remember here is that faith can heal one's friends. Faith can heal one's friends. And I think this is so important that, you know, even if, if those we love uh, don't possess, don't share the same faith, that the faith that we have in calling out to God, in, in praying to Him, in asking for His mercy, that these are things that can really benefit our friends. And that this is something that, you know, can be very dramatic and very important in their, in their lives. You know, and sometimes we, we feel like we ourselves can't pray. And to know that we have someone else praying for us can be a great consolation. I know that for myself, I, one of the things I love about being a Dominican friar is the Dominican nuns, because we have around the world all these monasteries, these groups of, of very uh, holy, wonderful women who dedicate their life to praying, and especially to praying for our, our good works and uh, for our success 
in our ministry. And that's, that's really comforting to have. Now, another aspect, a whole other aspect of this healing story is, I think, the importance of miracles and how they're used by Jesus and how they're regarded by the people who approach him. And, you know, there's this sense in our society that miracles are opposed to science. But if you look at, at how um, people approach Jesus and approach these miracles and how Jesus uses, uses them, particularly in this story, in some sense, they're, I think they're, they're closely, closely related to what we would identify as science, which is where you're trying to find out uh, what you don't know by means of what you do know, and that observation, what you see with your own two eyes, is a crucial aspect of that. And so what Jesus ends up doing is that he, he argues for his invisible power by pointing to visible things, to observation. And he constructs in Luke 5 this kind of logical argument, and I'm, I'm going to lay it out here for you in, step by step. So first, Jesus makes the uh, assertion that saying, get up and walk, is greater than saying your sins are forgiven. Which should strike us as really weird. Because you think being friends with God and having all the obstacles to that, your sins removed, would be more important than getting up and walking. I mean, don't get me wrong, I enjoy walking around. But if I had to choose between walking and being God's friend, I'm going to choose being God's friend. Because at the end of the day, that, that's going to be much more helpful and, and is a much better sort of thing. But Jesus says getting, saying to someone getting up and walking is greater. Or it's, it's, it's harder to say. Why? Because it's visible. It's visible. You can prove it right away. If someone says, oh, your sins are forgiven, well, you don't know. You can't see that. You can't see that. But get up and walk, that's irrefutable. Either the paralyzed person gets up and walks or they don't. Boom. That's it. So Jesus sets up this thing saying, get up and walk is the harder thing to say rather than your sins are forgiven. Secondly, if you can do a difficult task, you can do an easier version of that same task. So, for instance, if you can go to the gym and bench press 200 pounds, good for you. It means, logically, you can also bench press 100 pounds. If you can memorize 20 random digits in a row, you can memorize 10. So, uh, if, you can, if you can say the, well, what this points to is the third thing here, the logical conclusion of steps 1 and 2. If you have the power to make the lame walk, well then, when you say your sins are forgiven, it seems like you have you would have that power as well. Because saying get up and walk, that's the more difficult thing to say. So if you can say the more difficult thing and have it be effective, you should be able to say the easier thing. Fourthly, Jesus now does a demonstration, an experiment, you might say. Jesus says walk, and what happens? The man does. Surprise, surprise. And fifthly, ergo, therefore, Jesus has the power to forgive sins because he's demonstrated that he has the ability to make one walk by command and that's a harder thing to say than your sins are forgiven. Right. So here's the big conclusion, though, of all of this. Miracles, the way Jesus uses miracles and the way that miracles are used by people to come to faith in Jesus is that miracles are visible proof of invisible power. And that's why people, when they see the miracles, they start to believe because they know there's something there that they don't see that's even greater.